All right, guys, let's talk about FRQ Type 5 table questions. Um, these are very common on the AP exam. The way that these work is typically you're going to be given a table of values. Um, I've seen these go back and forth between being calculator and non-calculator. They are probably more often non-calculator, though. Um, we need to be aware of how derivatives and integrals affect units. These problems are very much based on word problems, and so you have to understand units when you're doing these. And here are the common types of questions that we're going to go over and the typical point values that they're worth. So let's go ahead and get started here. So let's go ahead and say that I have a function here. And let's say that our units are for x. I'll just make up something here. Like let's say it's uh, let's say it's time. That's usually what it is. And let's say that y is. Um, let's just go ahead and say miles. It doesn't matter. Okay. So we have a function, and the output is in miles. That's the y values. The output. The input is time. Okay, so in this case, y prime will be in miles per hour. Y double prime will be in miles per hour squared. Okay, so basically every time we take a derivative, We divide by the input unit. You know, so for instance, on this case, y is just miles. So if I take the derivative of that, it becomes miles over hours. And if I take the derivative of that, it becomes miles over hours divided by hours again, which becomes miles per hour squared. So every time you take a derivative, you're dividing by the input unit. My input unit is hours. I was going with hours. So every time you take a derivative, you divide by an input. Now then it probably won't surprise you to know then that when you take an integral, you multiply by an input. So So for instance, let's say that I was taking the integral of y double prime. Well, I already know that y double prime is miles per hour squared. But since I'm integrating this, I'm going to multiply that by a time, and that's going to end up giving me a miles per hour, which makes sense because when you integrate a double derivative, you get a first derivative, and the first derivative has units of miles per hour. Likewise, if you integrate y prime, we know that the units for y prime are miles per hour, but since we're integrating it, we're going to multiply it by an hour, and that's going to end up giving me the answer is just going to be miles. And here's a really strange one. We haven't seen too many of these. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've been giving you one this year, but sometimes they'll give you something like this, and they might even want the units for this. Well, we know that y is miles, but since we're integrating it, the output will be mile hours, is what this is called, mile hours. You're multiplying miles by hours. In this case, hours don't cancel out. You actually just get a miles times hours. It's a weird thing. The closest example I can think of in real life where this happens is like the way that electricians measure the amount of energy used. They do it in kilowatt hours, um, but there's the idea. But the main thing I want you guys to get out of this is every time you take a derivative, you divide by an input unit, and every time you integrate, your units will change by multiplication of the input unit. Okay, So that's how derivatives and integrals affect units. You're going to want to be aware of that. So let's talk about the next topic here that will come up on these types of FRQs. Average rates of change, estimating instantaneous rates of change. As you guys may recall, 
the average rate of change is the slope of the secant line. Whereas an instantaneous rate of change is a slope of a tangent line. Okay, so if you have a function f, and we're going from point A to point B, a secant line is the line that connects those two dots. And its slope is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And a tangent line is the derivative at that point. That's his slope. Okay? Well, Here's, here's the fact I want you guys to be aware of. Um, if, I don't want that to be green, sorry. Let me try this one more time. If C is between A and B, and pretty close, we'll say. How's that for math language? If C is between A and B and pretty close to those values, then we can say that the average rate of change, the slope of the secant line, is pretty much going to give you the same thing as the instantaneous rate of change, or the slope of the tangent line. And you guys can see that. Let's go back to our example. Like, let's say I wanted to find what's my instantaneous rate of change right there. Well, if I pick two points that are really close to it and draw a line connecting them, that almost looks exactly like a tangent line. And so you can estimate the slope of a tangent line, or the instantaneous rate of change, by finding the average rate of change of two points that are really close to that point of tangency. All right. So that's a very common problem on these FRQ questions. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Um, so in the story problem we have here, it says, as a pot of tea cools, the temperature of the tea is modeled by the differentiable function h on the interval from 0 to 10 where t is measured in minutes. I'm going to underline those units because these problems are very unit-based problems. And temperature is measured in degrees Celsius. The values of h at selected values are shown in the table above. So this basically means at the beginning of our story problem, the temperature is 66 degrees. After two minutes have gone by, now the temperature in the pot of t is 60 degrees. So it's cooling down. Um, all right, next, let's go and take a look at Number one, find the average rate of change on the interval from 0 to 6. Well, how do you find an average rate of change? So that's going to be, number one, h of 6 minus h of 0 over 6 minus 0. h of 6 is 52. h of 0 is 66. 6 minus 0 is 6. And simplifying this, we get negative 14 over 6, which is negative 7 over 3. And we want to include our units. The top numbers are degrees Celsius. The bottom numbers are minutes. So what this means is, because they do want us to interpret it, is they want us to, remember, when you do an interpretation, you have to include three things. Interpretations need to include... Units of your input, units of the output, and the context of the problem. Okay, and so this interpretation is going to be, I think I'll need a little more space than that actually, on the interval the temperature decreases. Now how do I know it decreases? Because of that negative. Decreases 7 thirds degrees Celsius per minute. And I'm going to say on average. Because this is an average rate of change, it's not an instantaneous rate of change. And so 
on the interval from 0 to 6 minutes, there's my input units, the temperature decreases by 7 thirds, and then here's my output units, degrees Celsius per minute on average. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move on to number two. Now, number two is going to be a, solved in a very similar way to number one, but it is a different question. This one says estimate h prime of 9. So this is the instantaneous rate of change. In other words, how fast is that pot of tea cooling at the time 9 minutes? Well, I don't have an h prime value up here. I've only got h values. But here's what I know. I know that so long as I pick an interval that's really close to 9, like these two numbers here, going from 6 to 10, if I can find the average rate of change from 6 to 10, 9's right in the middle there, um, then I can use that average rate of change to estimate what the instantaneous rate is because the secant line will be really close to the tangent line at that point. So I can say that h prime of 9 is approximately equal to h of 10 minus h of 6 over 10 minus 6. And h of 10 is 43, h of 6 is 52, and 43 take away 52 is negative 9, and that's once again in degrees Celsius. And um, Now here's how I would interpret this one. I would say that the instantaneous rate of change at t equals 9 minutes is approximately, because I'm estimating it, decreasing at a rate of, uh, that was supposed to be 9 fourths, sorry, 9 fourths degrees Celsius per minute. There's my input units, there's my output units, and the context. So, and notice that I said this time the instantaneous rate of change, because that's what they're asking about, but I have to say it's approximately. I can't say it actually equals that, because it doesn't. Um, to have the instantaneous rate of change, we would actually need to know the derivative at that point. We don't know it. We can only estimate it. Okay, so you can see how I worded myself a little bit differently in each of those circumstances. That, you will see that question if you have a table problem, I guarantee you. Those are super, super common questions. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at another one. Um, now, the next three questions that we're going to look at are going to be Riemann sum questions. And, and once again, you're probably going to see one of these if you have a table FRQ. Okay? Um, so this is really just me reviewing with you guys how to do the Riemann sum questions. Okay? Um, so here we go. Estimate the integral of h of t from 2 to 10. Now you have to pay close attention to these from 2 to 10. So I'm only using this data here. I'm not going to use this one. Using a left-handed sum. And then we want to know is this an overestimate or an underestimate? And then we'll explain our reasoning. All right. So as you guys may recall, the distance from here to here, which is 4, is my base. So I've got three bases here, four, three, and one. Each of those bases has a height to them. And since we're doing a left-handed sum, we start on the left, and these are our heights of our triangles, but we don't use the last one. And so what we do is we do base times height, base times height, base times height. And I wouldn't waste my time working it out. I would just do 60 times four, plus 52 times 3, plus 1 times 44, and there's my answer for that. And I, I'm going to put approximately equals the integral from maybe 10, because remember, this is uh, what we call Riemann sum. It's where we use shapes to estimate the area under the curve, and we're using the common geometric shape of rectangles to do this. It's not exact. It's a close approximation. The integral is the actual area under the curve, but these Riemann sums that we're doing with geometric shapes are estimations. So I'm going to put the wiggly line. 
Would they penalize you for not putting a wiggly sign? I don't know. Um, I would say just, you know, know when you're doing an estimate and when you don't, and you'll be safe, right? So there's that. Now they want to know, is this an overestimate or an underestimate? Well, whether or not it's an overestimate or underestimate depends on two things. It depends on whether your function is increasing or decreasing and whether you are doing a left-hand sum or a right-hand sum. So I'm going to underline this. I'm going to draw a little arrow. And I'm going to put this up here. Is it increasing or decreasing? And is it left or right? Okay. Now, the temperature is decreasing. So what that means is that my function is moving in a downward direction. And we have a left-handed sum. So now I'm going to draw some rectangles with the corners on the left-hand side of the line. Now, as you guys can see, the rectangles are going over the line. So that would be an overestimate. But here's how you would say it. The picture does not count as an explanation. That's just me showing you guys how to figure it out. But the explanation would be it's an overestimate since H is decreasing. And we did a left-hand sum. It's two things. It depends on whether the function is increasing or decreasing and whether you did a right or a left-handed sum. And the way that I do is I just sketch a picture and look, hmm, are the rectangles going over the line or are they going under the line? If the rectangles are over, then it's an overestimate. And there you guys have it. So that's one type of Riemann question. Um, and just so you guys know, they can only ask you if it's an overestimate or underestimate if the function is always decreasing like it is here. Um, if the function's going up and down, they can't ask you the question because depending on what interval you're looking at, then it will change. Let's also take a look at a trapezoidal sum here. Um, right-handed sum, I'm not going to do the right-handed sum example here just to save time. It's the same thing, you just use the right heights instead of the left heights. But we will do a trapezoid sum, so let's do that. How do you do a trapezoid sum? Trapezoid sums are a little bit different. Um, once again, I'm only going from... 10 to 2. you got to pay attention to that. All right. Now, um, the distances from here to here are what we're going to call this time, I'm, I'm going to call them the height. And that seems a little bit weird, but that's what I'm going to call it. Okay? Because you might think in the last one, Mr. Bailey, you called those the bases on the last problem. There's a reason for it. Um, I'm not going to get into it right now just to save time, but there's a reason those are ones that we're going to call those the heights this time. And what these are is these are the bases. This is base 1, this is base 2, this is base 3, and this is base 4. Now the way that you find the area of a trapezoid is the height over 2 times the sum of the bases. Okay, so for instance, here will be my first trapezoid. My first two bases are 60 and 52. And then I'm going to take the height and divide that by 2. And that's the first area. Then the next one will be the next two, these guys. So for that one, my bases are 52 and 44. The height is 3, so we divide that by 2. And then finally, we have last set of two here, 44 and 43. My height of that one is 1. And once again, don't take the time to add it all up. The area under the curve is approximately equal to this. Now, notice I didn't ask you if this is an overestimate or an underestimate. You can't determine that with trapezoidal sums. It's not possible because the trapezoidal sums are better than rectangle sums because they actually get closer to the area. But that's because they actually have some that's above and some that's below. So it's not strictly an overestimate or an underestimate necessarily. Um, you can't tell. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the last type of Riemann sum that you guys are going to want to remember how to do here. And that would be um, the midpoint sum. All right, so here we go. Um, Something I forgot to put in here, which they do include, is how many subintervals, and they, they do that on all the problems.
I can only do two sub intervals this time um, because I didn't really have enough data to do more. Um, but what, what do we mean by that? We're only going to have two sub intervals. Well, here, here's what we mean. When they tell you how many, well, uh, this only works. You can only do this whenever these are equally spaced apart. Okay, so if they give you a midpoint sum problem, this is how you'll have to handle it. You do the last x minus the first x divided by the number of subintervals that they want to have. And so what you're going to be doing then is you're going to be going by fours. What do I mean by that? I mean that my first rectangle starts at zero and goes all the way up to four. My next rectangle starts at four and then goes all the way up to eight. Okay, so that's what I mean by we go by fours in those cases. Okay, now how how do these things work though exactly? Well, the distance from here to here is four, and the distance from here to here is four, and those are my bases. The heights are the middle points. So for this first rectangle, that's my height, and for the next rectangle. That's my height, because it's the one in the middle. Okay, so here's how we find these. We do base times height, so 4 times 60, plus base times height. And once again, this is an estimation. And I'm not going to work it out, but there it is. And that would roughly give us the area under the curve. So those are... The different types of Riemann sum problems you can expect to find, those are good ways to estimate the integral of the function in the table. Okay. Now, a pretty common question is to find the average value of a function. The average value of a function can be found by doing 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b. Okay. And what it tells you is, is it tells you the average height or y value. Same thing, right? That's what it tells you. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at a problem where that would come into play. And for these types of problems, it's usually going to involve some kind of a Riemann sum. Um, now, I'm going to have to add some more information to this one once again. Um, find the average temperature over the interval from 0 to 10 using a right hand Riemann sum. Now, I am going to do a right-handed Riemann sum now, so it's a lot like the left-handed Riemann sum. Um, and here we go. From here to here, these are my bases. Notice they're not equal. They don't have to be equal. They only have to be equal when you're doing the midpoint sums. And I'm doing a right-handed sum. So that means I'm going to start on the right, and I'm not going to use that. And I am going from 0 to 10. I'm using the whole table this time because it tells me to do that. Okay, So we do base times height. Well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Let me, let me back up a minute. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, here, here's how we find the average, right? It's 1 over b minus a times the integral of h on the interval from A to B, right? Now, that equals 1 over 10. And then the integral, we're going to estimate the integral, so I should put wiggly lines here, by doing a right-handed Riemann sum. So that's base times height, base times height, base times height, base times height. So basically, on these problems, if they ask you to find an average value of this function, then they're probably going to, usually what they'll do is they will they will have already had you do this part in an earlier question, finding the area of the curve. And then for this part, all you have to do is multiply it by one-tenth, and now you've got the average, and that's it. So that's how you find the average value of a function on an interval using Riemann sums. Now, all of these questions have involved finding an integral of this function, but I want to show you guys a question that looks kind of similar, but it's a little bit different. 
Before I do, let's review the fundamental theorem of calculus. As you guys may know, when you take the integral of a function, you integrate this function. So f prime would become f, right? And after you do that, you plug in the b and the a. Take a look at this question. This question looks pretty similar to the last one, right? But the difference is instead of taking the integral of h, I'm taking the integral of h prime. So I'm not finding the integral of this function. If I was, I would have to do some kind of a Riemann sum. But for this one, actually, we're just going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus because the integral of h prime is big H. And then we plug in the top number, and we plug in the bottom number and subtract those. So when you're finding the integral of the derivative of this function up here, it's actually a lot easier. You just integrate it so it becomes h, and then you plug in the numbers and subtract them. So h of 9, you can see from the table, is 44, and h of 2 is 60. And that would be what? That would be uh, 16, negative 16. Now, it does ask me to interpret it. So what does this mean? Well, this tells me the temperature of my function at 9 minutes. The temperature of my function at 9 minutes is 44 degrees Celsius. And the temperature of my function, of the pot of tea, I should say, at 2 minutes is 60 degrees Celsius. So what does this number represent? Well, it represents how much the temperature changed. I went from 44 degrees to, or I'm sorry, I went from 60 degrees to 44 degrees on the interval from 2 to 9. So in other words, it tells you how much the pot of tea's temperature changed over time. Um, this is also what's known as a net change problem. When you take the integral of a derivative, you get a net change. But we haven't quite finished interpreting it. So what are my input units? Well, those are time values. What is my output unit? That's a temperature. Why is it negative? Because it decreased. So how would we interpret this? Here's how you would say it. You would say the temperature of the pot of tea decreased, because it was negative, it decreased by 16 degrees Celsius on the interval, or I should say the time interval, t equals 2 minutes to t equals 9 minutes. Notice I have my input units, the minutes, I've got my output units, the degrees Celsius, and I have my context, which is the fact that we're talking about a pot of tea cooling down. All right? So there's that. Okay, moving along. So how do you know when you're going to use the FTC versus the Riemann sum? Um, whatever functions in the table... You're going to have some kind of a function in the table. You're going to use the FTC if you're integrating the derivative of the table function. You're going to use a Riemann sum if you're integrating the table function. So that's how you would know the difference between whether you're just going to do the fundamental theorem of calculus and versus a Riemann sum. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and move on. I think our last topic on, no, we've got a little bit, wow, we've got a little bit more to go. Uh, mean value theorem. All right. All right. So the mean value theorem basically just tells us that if our function, if f is continuous, on the closed interval a and b, so that means I have a function that's going from A to B, and it actually exists at those endpoints with no holes or gaps in between. So if F is continuous on that interval and differentiable on that interval, and, and for the differentiability, we don't include the endpoint. So in other words, there's no cusps. That's the only way a function could be continuous but not differentiable is if there's a cusp. So if you had something like this, the mean value theorem no longer applies. All right. So if f is continuous and differentiable, then there is a value c in between these two numbers, a and b, 
there is a value C such that the following occurs. The average rate of change on the interval, represented by the slope of the secant line, right, is exactly equal to the instantaneous rate of change at that point C. In other words, those two lines would be parallel because they have the same slopes. Okay, so that's the mean value theorem. It has to be continuous and differentiable, and if that's the case, then there has to be some C value in between A and B such that the slope of the secant line is equal to the slope of the tangent line. Okay, so those are pretty common questions that come up on these ones. It says here, as a pot of tea cools, the temperature of the tea is modeled by a differentiable function. I guess I don't need to read all that again. The question here is, is there a time when h prime of t equals 2.3 on the interval from 0 to 10. Now, just so you guys know, a lot of times the answer is yes. It's possible the answer is no. If you if you are looking at a graph, for instance, and you see some cusps, then maybe the answer is no. But a lot of times it's just a, a table problem like this. Um, it's probably going to exist. And I say just go for it. So here's how you would do it. You'd say since h is differentiable, on 0, 10. How do I know that? It tells us it is. And therefore, it's continuous on this. Now, how do I know that? A little while back, we learned that if a function is differentiable, it has to be continuous. The opposite's not true, but if a function is differentiable, it has to be continuous. So since h is differentiable on this interval and continuous on this interval, there must be a C such that the following occurs. The rate of change of H at that point is equal to the average rate of change on the interval that they're asking about. H of 10 is 43 h of 0 is 66, and this is 10. And sure enough, if you work that out, guess what you get? 2.3, which is what they were asking about. So is there a time when the rate of change is equal to 2.3? And the answer is yes. Since h is differentiable and continuous, there has to be a c such that h prime of c is equal to the average rate of change, which is 2.3 on that interval. That's usually how those problems will work out. Okay? Um, they can get kind of sneaky. And, and not make it these numbers, which are the ones that they give you. They could technically pick any two numbers, but I don't think they're going to do that. The two numbers they have to pick have to be between 0 and 10 or at 0 and 10, but I don't think they would do that. And the reason why is because there's a lot of different combinations, and that's a major waste of time. So they almost always just give you the numbers that they want you to use, and usually the answer works out. So just go ahead and assume that it's going to work and go for it. All right, we've already talked about the intermediate value theorem in our notes from earlier this week, but we'll talk about it again. The intermediate value theorem basically says that if you're going from A to B and it's continuous, and some value k is between the y values for those points. So here's f of a, here's f of b, and k is somewhere in here. Then there has to be some value of c in between a and b that will give you that k value. Okay, that's the intermediate value theorem. Now, the reason I'm talking about it in the context of these problems as well is because they come up in table problems as well. Now, you'll notice that this question looks a lot like the mean value theorem that we saw here. Look at, look at the one we looked at before. Is there a time when h prime of 3 equals 2.3? And now look at this one. Is there a time when h of t equals 50? The only difference is there's no prime here. Okay, so when there's no prime, when, when you're trying to find a value of this function, not its derivative, but of this function, that's an IVT question. 
So let's take a look. Is the function continuous? Yes, because it's differentiable. Now you don't have to write this down on your actual FRQ, but I'm going to do it here. And you should do it on your notes at least. It's continuous. Let's find out what h of 10 is. And let's find out what h of 0 is. h of 10 is 43. h of 0 is 66. Is the number they're asking about in between those? Yep, sure enough. So if it's continuous and the number they're asking about is in between those two endpoints, then yes, the answer is yes. This has to be true. So we would say yes, since h is continuous and goes from 43 to 66, thus implying 50s between there, there must be some c such that h of c equals 50. Okay, so that's the intermediate value theorem. It looks a lot like the mean value theorem, but they are slightly different. And so that brings us to our final slide for this set. When do we use the IVT and when do we use the MVT? So if they're asking about the function in the table, then you're going to use IVT. In other words, does h of c equals 50? Because h was the function in the table. But if they're asking about the derivative of the table function, then you would use MVT. So in that case, does H, does H prime equal 2.3? Okay, so that's how you can tell when you're going to use each one of those different theorems. And that'll end our notes for the day. Until later.